Hello again, everyone, and welcome inside the latest edition of the Adam Jones Podcast. I'm Jerry Coleman. He's the former five-time All-Star Adam Jones as we broadcast another week from Jimmy's Famous Seafood, which will sponsor our upcoming guests. And it's number 22, Jim Palmer, joining us. The Hall of Famer will be along in just a moment. We will catch up with Jim. We'll also do another edition of Socially Speaking, where we answer a few questions via social media, or you can review and rate our podcast. And subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. But first, Adam, let's bring him in. We've been waiting to get him on, the Hall of Fame pitcher, the Masson broadcaster. He is Jim Palmer. Jim, thanks for taking the time. And, you know, when was the last time you had this much fun calling Orioles games? I know you've been doing it for decades now. Well, Adam would know. I mean, uh, we could go back to 2014 when they went wire to wire. You know, 2016 wasn't bad. It didn't end well, but... Uh, Everybody's still wondering. We're, we're waiting for Buck's book to come out so he can tell us why I didn't use Britain. Uh, Jerobi wrote a, you know, she wrote a column the other day. I mean, I had a pretty good relationship with Buck. And, you know, I go to spring training and I said, hey, what happened up in Toronto? You know, because it, it wasn't, and to me, it wasn't that he didn't use Zach Britton. He just had two other better options with Tommy Hunter and uh, who would, uh, with somebody else. I, you know, it, uh, you know, I mean. Ovaldo was, you know, one of the one of the great guys of all time, but he was not a reliever. His numbers didn't indicate that. So you had a couple of oh, Dylan Bundy was the third guy. So you know, and he says you'll have to read about it in the book. So I guess we're going to have to wait to read about it in the book. And you know, it, it will be a great book because Buck Showalter, as we all both know, has he has more stories than 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 the Naked City, where there's eight million stories in the Naked City. Adam, you're too young. You've been again. You've been around for a long time watching baseball. For a very very long time you've seen rebuilds and now you're getting to see the payoff from the rebuild what do you see specifically with this team over the last four years since uh five years since you know we were the my my era was gone well i i think i see patience that's the first thing you know brandon hyde came over um uh, you know he had been with the uh with the, the marlins and then he went to the the cubs they were in a rebuild he was first base coach and then when did, uh, Dave Martinez went over and managed the Nats. He became the bench coach. So he had a chance to, you know, see Joe Madden, who's a rather unique manager uh, in the sense that he does things differently, but he also wins. Kind of a nice combination. Um, so he, they, they, when Michael Elias came in 2019, um, hey, one of the first things he ever did, I, I, I was going over, I, got out, I was driving over to Washington to pick my wife up and, he calls and I talked to him for about an hour and a half. He just, you know, that was, I, I guess he wanted to kind of know people who have been around the organization for a long time. So, you know, he comes over, he gets Brandon and you need patience because this club wasn't going to win. I mean, you know, if you go back to what, 2021, you know, forget the pandemic year. They actually played pretty well that year, you know, short season. Um, they were 52 and 110. And then all of a sudden last year, I mean, to me, last year was the 10 game winning streak. Um, right at the end of uh, July, uh, Tyler Wells pitched a great game. It had two blown saves by the all-star closer, Jorge Lopez. So you're going, geez, this club's really going down the tubes. They're about nine, ten games under 500. They won ten in a row. They won three nothing the next day, and then won nine ensuing games. And all of a sudden, you're looking at a club that says, "Whoa, we might have a chance to win." So, um, and you know, and they played what four games over 500 after. You know, going 52 and uh, 110. So you, you, and you know what? The, it's funny, but you, you know, if you go back and back into the what, 2014-15, uh, when Sports Illustrated had a team that Mike Elias was part of running uh, down in Houston, they they said the next World Series team, and you know, they projected two or three years down the road because Mike Elias has done exactly what they did down in Houston, with a couple of exceptions, and these are key exceptions. Um, uh, you know, rebuild through the draft, re, re, rebuild by maybe adding, uh, you know, Guriel from Cuba. Uh, they went out and they got Verlander and Cole. So they had enough young players and enough revenue to go out and actually pay a pitcher. What, 20, you know, Cole wasn't making that much money, but Verlander was around $30 million. So, you know, so they rebuilt the ball club. But when I look at this Oriole team and, you know, Adam, you were a terrific athlete. I mean, you know, people, I, I don't, think people grasp how, I mean, I, I've said this many times and not, not only to you, but to on the air is I don't know if anybody other than maybe Cal has made more of a difference in the community uh, than you did, you know, and you, you what he played, I think 
nine, 10 years or whatever. You got there when you were 22. Um, and, you know, you, you, you know, played into your 30s. You know, a typical year for you, and you can relate to a lot of these young guys, was trying to come to the big leagues. What, he had nine home runs your first year, you know, and then in 500 at bats. And then all of a sudden, you, you went, what, seven, next seven years hitting 25 or more home runs. You know, you used to come down on the field and say, well, my friends are telling me that uh, you're on me for swinging the too many balls out of the strike zone. <laughs> but it worked for you, you know, yeah. and it's kind of interesting when I look at some of the young guys. I mean, Gunnar Henderson, if I'd been running this club, I probably would have sent him back for a couple of weeks early in the year. But they stuck with him. And, you know, he's a marvelous player. I mean, his, his, his the way he the speed of the game, I mean, you know how it great athletes and you were one of them i mean you know the game speeds up when you have somebody that can run the bases and can play as many positions as he can and you know he's learning how to hit breaking balls and i think he's just learning that the game is pretty fast up here and it's not an easy game as you know as well as anybody so you know you see those kind of guys and then we've seen the westbergs and we you know we saw adley rushman come up last year and the club has been over 500 since he came here because you have one of the better catchers in the big leagues you know, the young pitchers, I think they come a long way. The big question is going to be because of the pandemic and because of the fact they may be pitchers in the minor leagues, none of these guys have pitched a lot of innings. And if they're going to be in the postseason this year, they're going to have to do that. I wanted to ask about that innings because obviously that's always a focal point with everybody nowadays. The last five, six years is, oh, how many innings is this guy? Is he reaching innings? I can't tell that to you or Fergie Jenkins, because you two guys are just innings eaters. And I love talking to both of you about that. I mean, obviously, I know the answer coming from you that, of course, you don't want to take time off. I called David Johnson, and, you know, when Strasburg came up, they said, we're going to have to, uh, you know, cut him down. Now, they're, they're, we've got a chance to go to the postseason. I said, well, Davey, you got the all-star breakup. Let him miss a start before. Let him be the fifth guy afterwards. You know, try to – and he was so good that he was pitching a lot of innings. So, you know, I mean, that creates a problem now, but you know, not, and I mean, Braddish has pitched great. I mean, he struggled his last game up in Philadelphia and so on and whatever, but, uh, you know, they're learning how to pitch. But, you know, you see it with Tyler Wells. He's been struggling as of late. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, they sent him back to, down to Bowie to kind of for a, maybe a reset. Um, but I think you kind of learn. You know, Adam, the game has changed in the sense that, and I was looking, you know, I, I played for Cal Ripken's uh, dad, uh, Cal Ripken Sr., uh, you know, high A when I was 18. And, uh, you know, I think I pitched 129 innings, walked 130. But I only gave up about two and a half runs a game, but uh, I was really wild. Then they said, you might have a chance to go to the big league, so we want you to go to instructional league. So I went to down instructional league, pitched another 53 or 54 innings. So I pitched close to, what, almost 190 innings. When I was 18 years old, no rotator cuff exercises, no trainers, no massage therapist, you know, just baseball. I mean, you know, I mean, hey, I, I, don't, I mean, I, I've always been a big fan. I, I ran into one of the trading deadlines. I ran into one of the uh, Dodger scouts who had, he was a guy, and you'd know his name, would pick you up and you would, you know, you didn't live in a great neighborhood in, in, mm -hmm. in San Diego, and he would, he would pick you up and you would wait at a bus stop in a kind of an unsavory part of town. And he said, that's when he knew that you were going to be and end up being the player that you Greg Weissman. could be. Yeah. And he said, not many kids would do that. Every day he'd come guess you, I guess, you know, because he lived up north. Uh, I don't know. He looked up, you know, you know, San Diego better than I do. Yeah. Um, even though when I took you out to the ballpark that day, I said, this is La La Land down here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> why would anybody? And I, and you know, they're almost selling out every game now, even though they're underperformed. But yeah, it's a whole other world. But he told me about what you did to be able to, uh, you know, to end up being the player you were. So, you know, it takes all that kind of stuff. But I got a chance to pitch. You know, I went to the instructional league, and the next year in '19, you kind of had to be in the big leagues. But I was there, and you know, I didn't pitch a lot that year. And the next year, I pitched over 200 innings. But I had gotten that my training wheels, so to speak. I had gotten the training wheels in the minor leagues. You know, it's funny, Grayson Rodriguez has a chance to be a great pitcher. But I said, uh, how about pitch counts? Because, you know, I, you know, I'd read the numbers, 85 pitches or whatever. He said, I've never thrown over 100 pitches, even in high school. Mm. Now, I went to Babe Ruth finals in, in, in Hawaii, and I walked 18 guys, pitched 10 innings, and uh, gave up three runs, went to center field, hit a three-run home run, came back with two days rest, and lost in the finals. So I must have thrown a couple hundred pitches but it was a different game back then.
Time now for a quick break as we salute our dedicated sponsors and then more of our continuing conversation with Orioles Hall of Famer and Masson broadcaster, Jim Palmer, right here on the Adam Jones Podcast. The Adam Jones Podcast is brought to you by Jimmy's Famous Seafood, Charm City's favorite crab cake destination. Local sports fan? Experience the ultimate pregame party at the tailgate. Cheer on the Ravens with iconic live performances, an open bar, and mouth-watering eats. Can't make it? No worries. Bring the same food that caught the attention of the Food Network right to your doorstep. Shipping East Coast recipes nationwide. Jimmy's Famous Seafood is the official sponsor of the guests appearing on the Adam Jones Podcast. And by our friends at the Weinman Company. By Hollywood Casino Perryville. For some, it's a game of chance, but for you, it's a game of choice. Hollywood and Barstool are bringing you more ways to bet in Maryland. Catch all the action in person at Hollywood Casino Perryville at the Barstool Sportsbook or bet online with the Barstool Sportsbook app. When you download the Barstool Sportsbook app, register and wager, you can get up to $1,000 bonus cash, plus up to $1,000 when you sign up and wager in person at Hollywood Casino Perryville. Play from anywhere and get up to $2,000. The choice is yours. Must be in the state of Maryland to wager and over 21. Please play responsibly. For help, visit mdgamblinghelp.org or call 1-800-GAMBLER. By Jack Daniels, two legends, one can. Jack and Coke, the number one cocktail in the world, is now available in a can. Yes, that's true. Jack Daniels Tennessee Whiskey, mixed with Coca-Cola or Coca-Cola Zero Sugar, are now both available in a can. Two legends, one can. Jack and Coke, ready to drink? Please drink responsibly. Whiskey specialty, 7% alcohol by volume. Jack Daniels Tennessee Whiskey, Lynchburg, Tennessee. By G-Leaf, medical cannabis only. Visit gleaf.com. Medical cannabis is for qualified Maryland patients only. The Adam Jones Podcast is brought to you by Royal Farms. Download the Royal Farms app from the Apple App Store or Google Play today. New Royal Farms Rewards members will get a free any size cup of Royal Farms award winning coffee just for signing up. Hey Justin, keep an eye on the time. It's your night to handle dinner. No worries. Got it covered. It's great getting dinner ready with no worries. That's why I never waste time and go straight to Royal Farms. Their chicken is fresh, never frozen, hand breaded and cooked right in the store. Oh wow, this smells amazing. I'm so impressed. Real fresh, real fast, Royal Farms. And a reminder, if you guys are enjoying this podcast, make sure to check out the Baltimore Banner at thebaltimorebanner.com slash AJ to get started. Again, that's thebaltimorebanner.com slash AJ to get six months of unlimited digital access for only a dollar. Now back to our chat with Orioles Hall of Famer and Masson broadcaster Jim Palmer right here on the Adam Jones podcast. And I said, you know, one of the great things about getting to pitch a lot is that you get to pitch when you're tired. And if you never pitch when you're tired, how do you ever learn when maybe you don't have your best stuff or, you know, maybe, you know, but now we know the numbers. Hey, they look third time through the order. If your batting average goes up, um, what are they doing? They're going to the bullpen. And how's that play out in October for some of the teams to get to the postseason? Their guys are exhausted, yeah. you know. So, you know, ideally, I mean, I got a text a couple weeks ago when Dean Kramer pitched the uh, Sunday uh, ESPN game from Scotty Ma- Scotty McGregor. He goes seven runs in the first. They couldn't even go five innings. Now he, you know, he's pitched well for us and all that kind of stuff. But it's it's just as you know a different game. And it you know sounds like I'm being critical. It's just I actually think when you pitch complete games or you know, you play in the playoffs, you, the, the spotlight comes down on you, and you, you you learn about yourself. You learn about what's in your heart and how smart you are and can you adapt and can you make all these different changes. So, you know, that's what I think uh, I would miss if I was a young pitcher now. Now, I wouldn't mind getting paid because you get more money than I did. Pardon my wife. She's Susan's, Susan's going out. Oh, speaking. Yeah, nowadays, it seems like less work, more money, right? Well, you know, I, I – People say, well, why do they pitch less innings? I said, well, if you pay more. When I got in the Hall of Fame, I said, that's my, really, that's my biggest fear of the game. And it, it sound, again, it sounds like I'm being really critical. But if you pay more for less, what do you get? Less. You know, I mean, the first thing, thing is, you know, you sell Mercedes, right? You have a great year. Sell 100 cars. You know, you're on commission. Next year, the owner says, God, you were so great last year. I'm not even going to put you on commission. I'm just going to pay you what you made last year. You think you're selling 100 cars? Now, maybe if you're a special person, you might, but most people aren't. You know, going, hey, God, I still feel like going into work today. Uh, let's go to the golf course. You know, <laughs> instead of, you know, somewhere. so, I mean, I, I just played mostly in an era where every pitch you threw meant 
um, you know, people go, well, geez, you know, um, what kind of raise did you get when you win 20 games? I said, well, now they got a $15,000 raise. And so I said, if you win 20, you know, you could go from 55,000 to, you know, to, to 70. And if you want to, and if you want to sell young, you could get an extra five grand. So you get a $20,000 raise. So it was a different game back then. And, you know, you got paid, pitched for, you got paid for complete games and you got paid, you know, the, the, everybody says, gee, you, you pitched when you had four 20 game winners. I said, you know what? I think the, the most amazing thing about that year was we had 72 complete games. Wow. Four guys that won 20 games, but we had 72 complete games. Who's the closer? I don't think we had one. <laughs> <laughs> you need hey, I do want to ask you about closers. And as a three-time Cy Young Award winner, they were talking and they have been talking about Batista being a candidate, getting consideration. I don't think anyone's won a Cy Young out of the bullpen since, what, Eric Gagne? Yeah, and he might have had a little help somewhere. Yeah. Here, but, it, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, um, well, you know, it's funny. I, I, I won three Cy Youngs and I finished second in 77. Guess who won Sparky Lyle had 27 saves. Ooh. But they were different kind of saves back then, you know, multiple innings and whatever. Plus, he played for the Yankees. They ended up going to the World Series beating the Dodgers. So, um, and I finished second. So, I could have got an extra 5000 So So, bl- every time I see Sparky, I blame him. Blame him, you owe me $5,000 because you won the Cy Young. But, no, you know, I mean, Felix Batista is one of them. I mean, there's, the Orioles are, the, the, without a doubt, the Orioles are the, the, the best story in baseball. Um I mean, they just are because nobody expected this. And then to have a guy that, you know, comes and, uh, you know, they, he gets released by the Dolphins or the Dolphins, the Marlins, uh, you know, he can't throw strikes. I mean, I certainly know about that. And then now all of a sudden you have the most overwhelmingly powerful guy. And, you know, for a 6'8 guy, everybody talks about, you know, he, he, that's why they don't have windups and all that kind of stuff. He, he's got ama- amazing body control, uh, you know, great stuff, you know, fastball, whatever. 99 to 102, you know, the splitter, it went away for a couple of weeks. Now it's back. Um, you know, he throws some sliders every once in a while and he's durable. And, you know, last year had a little bit of knee problems, but again, can you imagine uh, weighing about 270 pounds and land, landing on that left knee? That might cost your knee hurts a little bit too, but you know, and it's funny. I used to always talk to Lou Pinello when he managed the uh, Mariners, your team uh, out of where you came from. Thank God we made that trade. Um, thank you for Eric Bedard. But anyway, uh, I, he says, Jimmy, you know, and I, I, when I played Nava, or we actually, uh, Luke came over and played for about a month and they went to instructional league, so I knew him a little bit. He goes, Jimmy, you got to win the games you're supposed to win. And that's what a closer does. I mean, look at the Yankees. You know, I mean, Mariano's one of the greatest reliever ever because, and the Yankees had, what, four out of five world championships. So, you know, it takes – that's, that's again, if you're going to look at the formula, you better have a great back end of the bullpen. And, you know, last year the bullpen maybe even a little better only because they had Dylan Tate who pitched great. Uh, you know, I mean, you had uh, CNL Perez who came out of nowhere. You know, great arm, no command. This year has been a little bit more of a struggle. But, again, the bullpen and, uh, you know, it looks like it's – I keep telling people, I talked to Caleb Joseph who does the, the some of the Blue Jay games. I said, you know, the key to our game – Keep Cano and uh, Batista out of the game, and you're probably going to win the game against the Orioles. But when they're in the game, Orioles- yeah, um, winning pedigree. Obviously, you won a championship, won a World Series, Cy Youngs. I mean, accolades throughout the roof. What does this team need in the dog days of August and in September? First off, to win a division, but play deep into it. As you know, again, they're the. I think they're the greatest story this year, also. But that story needs a really good ending. What do they need to do the next, you know, six weeks in order to secure something going and play play special ball in October? It's funny, you know, we all know it's about the journey, not the destination. So, you know, you can look down the road and you can say, well, you know, we want to be playing in late October. So what's it going to take? It's going to have to take a special effort from the, the starting pitchers. Um, you know, um, the, you know, it's funny, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had the uh, the, the 40th anniversary of the uh, of the Orioles, uh, you know, winning the, the last World Series in 83. And, uh, you know, Rick Dempsey was the most valuable player. Cal was the uh, most valuable player that year. Eddie Murray, you know, another Hall of Famer was uh, second, I think, in the voting. Had a tremendous year. You could have really picked both either one of them. They had both had that great of years. Um, but one of the big trades we made, we made a couple of trades to get a little bit better. Uh, you know, we got Tito Landrum who hit the home runoff of Brett, 
Brett Byrne and, and you know, in, in the division to get us, you know, to, to the point where we could actually get to the World Series. So you need to make some acquisitions, you know, whether they do that or not. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times it may, may even be, even though a guy may not uh, be able to, um, you know, be on your postseason roster, you might want to get a guy after the trade deadline that somehow gets through waivers that help you in the, in the month of September, even though he won't be eligible for the playoffs. So there's all kinds of ways of doing it. And the other way is just, you know, uh, Adam, as well as anybody, uh, you know, can you play consistent baseball and, uh, you know, can you relax? Can you do all the things that allow you to be the same kind of player? Because we all know if you've ever played the game, that a game in, in September or a game in April, is they, they have equal value. It just seems like because the, you know, the pennant race this season is waning down that, you, you know, they have more import. But the Orioles have done such a great job of winning the one-run games and all that, so they just have to continue doing that. And, you know, will they be able to do that? I don't know. All right, I wanted to ask you uh, about the rule changes and all that. And here we are in August talking about them. I don't hear a whole lot of complaints. I wanted to get your impressions on what you like, maybe what you don't like. And also, should there be a different standard or set of rules maybe as we move into the postseason like some players have wanted? Uh, I like the rules. I mean, the games, the games are quicker. Uh, they're crisper. Um, I, I like the, the game the way it is. I mean, I you know, I'm. I, it's funny because I would, you know, I'm, you know, Adam, I'd come down and always hang around, um, hang around the um, – you know, the cage and all that, and I'm watching guys. You know the the same mannerisms they have in the game they don't have in the game. You know you what you have batting gloves on, you don't adjust them between every pitch and batting practice, but you do in the game because I think it's you know it's it's like I, I like Kyle Bradish. He every time he throws a pitch, he comes back and rubs the ball up. Now I never rubbed the ball up because I was you know maybe going to throw 150 pitches or 40 pitch whatever it took, and that makes you tired. I mean just imagine every time you come back and you throw 130 pitches. They don't, which you don't do now, but if you're throwing 130, 40, 50, 60, 171 on a play World Series game, you rub the ball up. Does it, wouldn't that tire out your flexors and your extensors? So I think there's certain mannerisms that guys get. So I love the fact that the game is crisper. Uh, I don't think you know. I mean, I know that you know um, you know Adovino struggles because he takes longer. But uh, you know, one of the great Kenley Jansen's probably going to be a Hall of Fame your closer. He he took 31 seconds between pitches. He's not having any problems. Because he adjusted game, you know, as we all know, the games. Uh, I like the, you know, the bigger bases. I don't think it's made a whole lot of difference. You know, uh, I love the fact that now you have to play real baseball where you can't shift. You can't throw a 108 mile per hour ground ball between first and second and think you made a good pitch. Now it's a base hit because you don't have the shift on. I mean, you know, so, you know, batting averages on lefties have gone up. Stolen bases have gone up. I think it makes the offenses up a little bit. Ball's more lively. They won't tell us, but it is. You know, even though a lot of guys aren't hitting that many more home runs, but yeah, the, if you hit the ball well, it's going to carry much more so than last year. At least it looks that way. Um, so I love the, the rule changes. Yeah, you know, people that, that one the, the one they don't like and they don't have in the postseason is that you know starting the extra inning games, uh, you know, with a runner, the ghost runner at, at the second base that doesn't happen in the playoffs. I kind of like it. You played on the team. Uh, what 2014? We won 16 straight extra inning games. And the greatest one, maybe one of the greatest games ever, even though there was one out in Seattle where they got the leadoff guy on for six innings, we won in the 17th inning, was the game up where you hit the three-run home runs off our former center fielder, number one draft choice, Darnell. And then Chris Davis comes in and strikes out Adrian uh, Gonzalez when he's trying to hit a three-run home run to tie the game up on a great splitter. So, you know, those, those games were very exciting. But, you know, the voice, you know, you get older. <laughs> you, don't want to, you don't want to talk for 16 innings. Speaking of the shift, Jim, when he played, would do his own shift with the infielders. Uh, that was the first time I'd ever seen that with a major league pitcher where you would maybe move Mark Belanger or Bobby Gritch or a couple of guys around. No, I, I didn't move, move the gold say, gloves. Here. I moved the guys that didn't win the gold gloves. <laughs> I, you think I ever moved Brooks Robinson? Look going over at Brooks and saying, uh, hey, Brooksy, I want you to move over, you know, play where I want you to play. But I would say, hey, look out for a bunt. And he'd go, Jimmy. You think I don't know? You may not, but, but you know, you got to understand the game because the game changes. Uh, you know, you get a, you, in my era, if you were a left-handed hitter and you had a runner on first base and you couldn't hit a ball in the right field, you probably weren't going to play because it creates the first and third situation. And mm -hmm. another reason it creates a first and third situation is because your second baseman is paranoid about not being able to turn the double play. So what do they do? They come in and they come over a step or two. 
makes it easier to hit the ball to their left into right field. So you turn around and you go, hey, make sure you get, where am I on camera? Make sure you get one. Because I don't want the runner at third with less than two outs. I don't want to, I don't want the sacrifice fly or the infield back allowing a run because runs are, you know, when you give up a 2.86 for your career, you didn't like to give up runs. What it's going to take for the Orioles. The great thing about that year, we pitched five straight shutouts. We had a 2.07 ERA for the month of September. Now, you know, Tim McCarver, the the late Tim McCarver said, I I joined the Red Sox uh, right before the trading deadline and uh, one nothing one nothing, and then I pitched a six nothing shutout. We went to Cleveland, one nothing, two nothing. So those were five straight shutouts. Two oh seven ERA. Everybody, every day you came to the ballpark had a chance to help the team win. We had a meeting in Labor Day at Paul Blair's house. You know, Paul, the great center fielder, who won eight Gold Gloves. I don't, I don't know if you ever had a chance to meet Paul, but he was a terrific center fielder. Um, and we had a meeting, and basically he said we came up with our own bun sign, our own hit and run sign. Because Earl was playing, Earl Weaver, you know, the Hall of Fame manager, was playing for three-run home runs, and we weren't hitting him. So, you know, and, we, and then we went 25 out of now. We never really made a big deal out of it, but we were frustrated. We knew what we could do as a team. Um, I think this team, you know, talking about the Orioles this year, they know what they can do. You know, they can win the, you know, the, the, the close games. They don't usually beat themselves, which is, a, again, a, you know, a, a indication of, of teams that, that, that are good ball clubs. Now, again, we're going to see how long, you know, it's funny. I never ran any marathons, but if you're running the Boston Marathon, what's the last part of the uh, of the marathon? Heartbreak hit, hill. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there have been a lot of teams in, in September that they run into heartbreak hill and they are either never experienced it or they haven't made any additions or you get injuries. I mean, when you look at the Orioles, you, you, you almost lost Mountcastle for a month. You lost Mullins has been in and out of the lineup for five or six weeks, and we know what an impact player he, he can be when he's swinging the bat well. So they've had other guys, you know, take up their places. You know, Ryan O'Hearn, he looks, to me, he looks like the Corey Kluber of hitters. You know, did you ever, you must have faced Kluber. Yeah. Faced Kluber. Oh, yeah, how good was he? he was I mean, his spider made a left turn at front at the front of the, of the plate, but he always had that stoic face. That's that's Ryan O'Hearn. He plays, he plays first base. Yeah, it's a game-winning home run. I mean, he's got it down, you know. You never had that. You smile too much. But you watch a lot of baseball. Who impresses you in today's current game? Who, and and as a as a position player, impresses you? As a pitcher, who reminds you of yourself, if anybody? Because it's tough to tough to mimic cakes. Um, well, you know, there's some. Yeah, it's funny. You know, when Seattle came in, and they have a, you know whether it's George Kirby or uh, Logan Gilbert or what Bryce Miller. You know, they have a lot of young pitchers that pitch a lot with their fastball. Um, you know, it's funny. We have, the Orioles have a lot of guys that, I mean, Dean Kramer can throw 94 to 97, but you would never know it sometimes, you know, because he doesn't think that's his best pitch. Uh, you know, Grayson Rodriguez had a great, you know, a great start, uh, against the Yankees. Uh, you know, he's throwing 99 and he understood that was his best pitch and, and whatever. So I think some of the younger guys, um, but you know, the, you know, the Acuna, Acuna juniors, which we, we don't really, you know, we saw him early in the year. You know, he can hit home runs and steal bases. You don't see a whole lot of players that can do that. Um, you know, there. I mean, Bichette is a really good player. You know, Vlad can hit with the best of them. He won a gold glove. I don't know how that ever happened, but he did. Um, you know, but, but you know, I mean, you're not going to take it away from him. It's like getting to the Hall of Fame and they're going, I'm taking your plaque off the wall. You know, too late. Sorry. Um, I got the glove. It's uh, I got the glove. It's up on my shelf. Uh, whatever. But in you know, and again, nothing. I mean, because he's, you know, I'm sure he's an improved first baseman. Whether if he's the best first baseman in the American League, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think know, so either. Whatever. So there are a lot of really good players out there and a lot of talented guys. I mean, is there, it's funny. I asked Brooks Robinson, you know, you know, Brooks, he's been around forever. And I said, have you ever seen a young guy that played for the Orioles that kind of had the physicality of, uh, of Gunnar Henderson? Now he's going to have to, you know, it's funny. I, you know, I was up in New York a couple of weeks ago doing games and I ran into Paul O'Neill who does the games. And I said, you know, you told me that Don Manley, who almost, you know, should be probably be a Hall, he's a Hall of Fame caliber player, except he had his sh- career was shortened because of a back problem. He told you that there was a lot of gold on left field when you try to hit lefties. And I said, you hit two, you won, you, you won a batting title, hit what, 347. You, you hit 300 five straight years in the Yankees. And yet you only hit 247 lifetime off lefties. He goes, 
it's hard to hit lefties. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it is because, I mean, you know as well as anybody, Adam, they got these, you know, it's a little bit different now. you got to face three hitters, but they had the guys that were just, you know, uh, when we beat the Red Sox, you know, that last, uh, we had uh, Rapata. You no, know, so they're, they're specialists. That's what they do. You know, it's a little bit different because they have to face three batters. I mean, Rapata, we had like five, Buck Showalter had five uh, lefties in our bullpen. And uh, uh, Terry Francona, who's going to go to the Hall of Fame as a, as, as a Hall of Fame manager, he never split his lefties. So you had Gonzalez and uh, Ortiz, and it was a heyday for Buck Showalter. And then, you know, that's when. Um, the, the curse of the Andino when he got the, the game winning hit and you know we ended up went beating the Red Sox and then the home run down in Tampa one of the great nights of baseball history so the, you know it's funny how when we you, you do smile at anything but but when you smile like that that's what baseball is all about uh, and I and I've been saying it because I played on teams where you know you you're, you're, they they take away everything you did yesterday and you, it's how good you are today and then in the ensuing days. But this, as you talked about earlier, this is the greatest story in baseball. And it's not probably getting as much, uh, you know, and which is fine. You know what? Because let the Orioles show up. Let them, you know, haven't been swept. I was talking to Caleb Show the other day. They, what, they've gone 60-some, 65, 66 series without being swept? No, it was 70. Yeah, 70. 70. Okay, it's worse oh. than I thought. No, actually, it's better than I thought. <laughs> I, but uh, you know what I'm saying. So so this is a team, and, and they, they – they, I know that they don't like you to talk about how low the payroll is, but there's, well, let's put it this way. I won't say how low the payroll is, but there's 20, what, 28 other teams that are spending more <laughs> out of the 30 teams. So they, the Orioles are really getting, you know, talk about getting less for more. They're, they're getting more for less. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tribute to everybody in the organization from Mike Elias all the way to the Brandon Hyde and the coaching staff and the minor league guys, some of these guys, the kids are coming up and, you know, we'll see how they play. I mean, you know, as well as anybody, Adam, that there's no guarantee if you're, you can be, a, you know, Cal Ripken Sr. used to say there's suspects and they're prospects. And he said, even the, the, the highest rated prospects are still suspects till they come to the big leagues and figure out how to play the game at this level. And, you know, that's the challenge of the game. You know, you, 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 you know, your what lifetime batting average was very cow like, 279, something like that. Something in that range. Typical yeah. year, 285, oh, 28 home runs, 29 home runs in here. <laughs> Never stole the bases you told me you were going to steal. I used not, to always, not enough. And I said, I said, can we well, did steal 16 one year or something? But I go, can you steal two or three bases a month? And it'd be spring training. He goes, well, of course. I'd get the Adam Jones look, of course. And I said, well, then why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I was running a lot. I know, yeah. But no, I, that's a very valid point. No, I'm only add kidding. That to my no, game. I kind of, but the game, is, it's funny. You know, you, you see guys, like I played with a lot of guys that were great infielders, and they'd steal 10 bases a year because the whole mental mechanism, you know, the, the Brady Anderson type of uh, mentality of, hey, you know what, you can't throw me out. I mean, it's 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 – or, or you can't hit my my best pitch, or you know what? I'm going to show you that when you throw me a low and away fastball, I'm going to hit it to right field and really confuse you as a pitcher. Because once you do that, I've got an information pitch. If you don't do that, I'm going. I know where I can go. It's like there's a big storm. I don't. I can just go low and away. Can't hit that pitch. Never showed me you can hit it. You hit it one time in a clutch situation, or even in the first inning. You know, all of a sudden the game changes, and you know. You know, it's just you knew you played with Scopey. I told Jonathan every year, I said, Jonathan, did they call you out on strike one? No. How about strike two? No. I said, so why don't you go up there and look for your pitch till you get the two strikes? Oh, what a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> then he, really? hit 30, he hit 32 home runs and then they traded him. And now he had, you know, nobody's telling him that anymore, apparently. <laughs> Well, you have the great perspective and the cat's eye view from the booth. And uh, I don't know how long you've been doing Orioles baseball. It's been decades. But as far as your mass in schedule goes, is that something you look at at the beginning of the year, the Orioles schedule, and then map out which games you want to do? Is that no, how it all goes no, down? In the old days. Back in the old days. when, when Adam, back, in the, back in the day when Adam Jones you know, you know per, patrolled uh, center field, I got to do that. You know, I work with Ben McDonald, who's a terrific broadcaster. He does the games that I don't do, So he, but he does college. So he's, you know, he I, I do my schedule, and he goes, no, oh, I'll, you know, in his Louisiana accent, GM, I'm going to have to go. I, I mean, I got to be in uh, 
from May 20th to uh, June 25th or 26th, uh, you know, I got to be doing college baseball. So, I, it, so I do a lot of games there, and that means I, I kind of like you know it would be ideal to do two weeks on, two weeks off, so you don't get away from the game. But I've had a couple of three weeks uh, stretches uh, this year. Um, but you know what? Listen, Ben's such a great guy. If, you know, if he wants to double dip, good luck. I just think the Orioles should pay him more, and then he'll just do Oreo games, and I'll be happier. But I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> just a suggestion. I'm just throwing it out there. Hey, Palmer, we have a we, – we got older listeners also who obviously massive fan of yours, massive fans of the older generation. What is one of the craziest Earl Weaver stories? Obviously, we know a lot of them. But what's the one that you can say that – Well, still the great – Bob Costas loves to tell the story, but um, – we traded for Pat Kelly, you know. Um, uh, you know, Pat Kelly came from the White Sox, and and, and when he when we were, you know, and you know, if if Adam, if you were um, listening, if you don't listen to the White Sox, they had they had Walt No No Neck Williams and um, left. They had uh, Carlos May Lee May's uh, brother in center, and they had Pat Kelly. And one day Harry Carey comes on for the White Sox. We got No Neck and left. And Carlos May had been in, you know, in the reserve, and he had lost part of his thumb. Didn't keep him from hitting. So we got no thumb in center, and we got Pat No Arm Kelly in right. So we trade. So we trade for Pat Kelly, you know. And Pat comes over, and he becomes a minister. So you know, he. I mean, one of the greatest guys you'll ever meet. I mean, really was. So you know, and he didn't work on his defense. He'd come out and he'd be talking about Christianity and left. And I would tell Earl, I said, listen, Earl, when, when he doesn't catch a ball and I, and I lose, don't we lose? Doesn't it go on the team record too? He goes, what are you talking about? I said, just tell him to work on his defense. But anyway, he hits a grand slam on a Sunday afternoon. It was one of those, you know, Baltimore, um, you know, sometimes you get those real crisp days. It's about 78 degrees and July, maybe early August, and Sunday afternoon, he hits a grand slam home run and runs around the bases, and he's become a minister. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And everybody's high-fiving him, and Earl's comes, you know, Earl used to stand right down by the end of the dugout, and he looks at Earl, and, he, and that's when he goes, uh, he goes, uh, and by the way, when are you going to walk with the Lord? And Earl looks at him and says, walk with the Lord. I'd rather have you walk with the bases loaded. And that's and Earl and Earl meant that. I mean, that was it, it was, so. That's that's probably the greatest uh, the greatest Pat, you know Pat Kelly Earl Williams. But you know he would run out to the mound and ask me if I was effing trying, and I said, "Excuse me." I mean, Mark Belanger won eight Gold Gloves. He, he dropped. He made two errors in the first inning. Boob dropped a pop fly in the sun, and he comes out and asks me if I'm trying. And I said, "You made out the starting lineup." I said, "You think Belanger tried to make two errors?" I said, "Or better yet, why don't you go ask our 280?" pound first baseman if maybe he, he meant to lose that ball in the sun because he may step on you, you know? And if he steps on you, it's all over. I said, so if that's all you have for me, get out of here. Anything get out of my face, up, right? Off the mound. But, you know, but yeah, I mean, Earl, but see the great thing about play, playing for Earl Weaver, playing for the Orioles, I played for almost 20 years and we had the best winning percentage in baseball. And, it, and it's kind of similar to what the Orioles are trying to do now. That happened because we had a great organization. So you had continuity. You know, you were there 10 years. You had a lot to do with the club going from not being really good. I never had to really suffer through that. My first year when I was 19, we won 94 games. We traded for Frank Robinson, who won the Triple Crown MVP, two, two more in the World Series for 51 home runs. Uh, we only won three more games. So we always had a good, pretty good club. And, you know, and then we went through, what, 109, 108, 100 win seasons. You said a key word, uh, legacy. And, you know, obviously your career, great legacy. 80s, legacy. The 90s, still great organization. Then obviously hit a big blip for 15 years. Then we were good again. How is, how is the fluctuation for your legacy also? Like, you're still part of Baltimore, no matter – I'm learning that myself now. Um, but when the team is good, how does that make you feel too, as oh. being a part of this franchise? Well, I mean, you know – I, I know I've been, I've been, I mean, obviously not that many fans can remember what I used. I always say, tell them who I used to be. But the point is, I mean, I, I obviously a little bit different because I still do television, but um, we have great fans. You know that as well as anybody. I mean, yeah. you know, like I said, I mean, you know, you, you, you have the, uh, you know, you, you have the ability as an African-American person to make such a difference. I live in the city. I, I know 
I've been here well, almost 60 years. I know how much help when West, when Governor Moore came on opening day and, you know, not on the air, I said, okay, so what are we going to do about education? What are we going to do about that? You know, I played boys club basketball, not in downtown Baltimore, but when I was thought I was going to be a, you know, a guy that went to UCLA and played with Jabbar, you know, because I was a really good basketball player. That's what I did in the summer when I wasn't playing baseball. So I know how important going to the Y or going to the boys club and whatever. And, and I know how important education is because I was adopted and my parents, one of the first things they said about being polite and getting a good education because it allows you to make better decisions, but also having a chance, you know, and that's what I just, said to, to Governor Moore, I said, how, how, how are, how are we, because I live in the city and I pay the taxes and I'm a, still a resident of Baltimore. How are we going to make a difference? What can we do? And that's, that's why when I see you with a hose in left field and coming back to this community, it, you know, it's pretty important. I did want to ask you about the advent of gambling uh, and how <laughs> it's become so prevalent in the sport when, what, 10, 15 years ago, Pete Rose was thrown out of the sport. Actually, it's been a lot longer. 87, it was 19, but the way it's changed. The the World yeah, I was doing a Little League World Series, and I got the, went down to the 7-Eleven to get the paper. It was the New York, I think the Daily News or something like that. Pete Rose suspended and whatever. I did the Costas shows with, with Pete uh, and John McEnroe, and, you know, he was next to me. I thought it was an intervention, and I, uh, I mean, because, you know, Pete had his Nehru jacket on. I think that's probably from 1975, and, you know, and, you know, he's a compulsive gambler, and, and, and I said, listen, Pete, anybody that ever saw you play, you know, whether as a teammate, as a fan, um, you know, the, the opponent, you knew how great a player you were, more hits than anybody in the history of the game. Charlie Hustle. You know, I mean, he, you know, switch hitter, could play all over, played second base, played third base, could play the outfield, you know, and uh, Terry Crowley, who was a, you know, terrific pinch hitter and great hitting instructor said he played every game like it was the ninth inning and you're one run down in the World Series. That's how he did every at bat meant that much. You'd come back on an off day. You'd been on a, uh, you know, two week road trip to the West Coast and you'd be flying all night and, and you'd have an off day on Monday and Pete would be coming down the bus saying, okay, Who's going to go home to sleep and then come hit at two o'clock? That was Pete Rose. But when I was on the Costa show, I said, so when Bart Giamani gave you a second chance and you really professed to love the game as much as you love it, why didn't you on your knees? Why didn't you grovel over? You know, because he, you know, he wanted to gamble. He wanted to do the things he wanted. But, you know, I mean, obviously when you have, you know, DraftKings, that's, I think that's our opening day, opening sponsor. You know, again, it's revenue. I mean, that's how you get the salaries and, you know, what, what's going on in the game. Um, you know, you hope you can control it, whether that'll happen or not. I mean, you know, you've seen how many players in the NFL got suspended, you know. So, um, you know, it's but it's not all right to gamble and it's not all right. I mean, I was sitting in the stands when I was hurt once and my choir pitched in the second game and he had had a little bit of his finger and I'm with a lawyer friend of mine and, uh, he said, he said, yeah, you know, Cuellar should be good in the second game. I said, yeah, he's having a little finger. And the guy jumps up and goes, this poor cell phones. And I said, where'd he go? He goes, well, I, you know, he might've been on the game. And I said, Barry, you can't ever put me in that position or anybody that plays the game, nor can you put yourself, you know, Adam as well. When I played a ball for Cal senior rule 26 D, I think it was no gambling. It's the sacrosanct thing. And all Pete had to do was go to Major League Baseball and go, you know, uh, you know, I'm a compulsive gambler, drugs, uh, you know, alcohol, whatever. They would have embraced him, but he didn't want to do it. So, you know what? He is, the, you know, he got the most hits than anybody, but it's not the same because of the fact that I never, I don't think he's ever shown remorse for what he did. You know, even though I'm sure he probably never, I don't think he ever bet, bet on the Reds to, to lose. But just the fact that you put yourself in the position as your Pete Rose, you're the manager at the time, or even the player, you know, you can't do that without, you know, you know, without taking responsibility. And we all know how important that is in, in any part or facet of our lives. No doubt. It's a bad look. And uh, I guess I'll end all this. Uh, you and I have both gone through this Mo's surgery, taking a bad look. I got the scar on my forehead. I was showing it to you in Tampa. I don't know if you can see it as much, but you spotted it out on my forehead in Tampa. But being in the sun isn't as glamorous as it used to be, Jim. No, not for me. I hide. <laughs> oh, no, it's funny. I, I was, I was, like I said, I was adopted, and uh, my wife Susan, she she actually traced my heritage. The bottom line is, I, 
I never knew I was Irish. She traced my heritage. I'm like 100% Irish. I would not, I would have been going to the beach as quickly as I did. People would, you know, Al Bumper used to run with us. Rick Nemsey used to run. We used to run 18 foul line to foul lines. That's something they don't do a lot of anymore running. So, uh, and, you know, and uh, they, they would always say, well, why, why are you hurry? Why don't you wait a little longer? I said, no, no, I want to take my girls to the beach. You know, they're down here for spring break or they were young at the time or whatever. Just think I'd be in a lot better shape. But the, the key is if, if, if you're going to go in the sun, sunscreen and you better you know as you get older you better you know better get a good friend maybe your next door neighbor is a dermatologist and also the dermatologists i will say this they are the people with the least amount of suntan or anything like they're pale as a ghost i told a guy i told a guy down in my down in uh, in west palm beach he told me that i should put effudex which is a, a white cream that kind of kills keratosis and kind of takes mild stuff he says you, you should put that on uh, four times a day for a month and oh. don't leave the house. And I said, you ought to, you ought to get out of the closet off. No, that, not that closet, but <laughs> closet, a little, uh, this guy was the palest guy. He looked like Casper the ghost. And he was my dermatologist. That was one visit, by the way. <laughs> Should have listened to him. All right. Well, stay healthy. We appreciate you taking the time and uh, very grateful to have you on the podcast and finally track you down. Uh, uh, Adam, great to see you back. You too. Thanks, Cakes. All right. There he goes. Jim Palmer joining us here on the Adam Jones podcast. Best stories, uh, the best stories. And I mean, I was fortunate enough to hear a lot of them around the turtle. That's the batting cage for you who don't know. And uh, no, it's just, I mean, it, I'd be a fool not to go and ask Jim Palmer questions. You know, I would just be a fool not to. And I'm glad Fountain I of had, information. I had that resource and players have their resource. Use them. Use the resource. He's been in every situation I've ever been in. Use them. So uh, it's great to it was great to talk. Well, not a whole lot to say after Jim Palmer had a lot to say during the podcast. AJ, we're going to get to socially speaking, but it's Palmer, man. You you gotta you gotta put one of them clocks, you know, to turn it upside down. The salt just <laughs> hold your arms and just let just let them let them go. Because, but it's great stories. You you have to just sit and listen. And uh, he needs to write a book. That was awesome. <laughs> he does need to write a book. You're right about that. All right, socially speaking, again, you can. Find us on all three social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Adam Jones Pod. Or you can rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube and qualify for a gift card like C Parrot 52. They're still talking about our live show two weeks later. C Parrot writes, and man, literally brought the live show back to Baltimore because he's a legend. We love Jerry too. Top tier podcast. Appreciate that comment. Heather Oriole 17 with this Apple Podcast review. Ooh. Baseball fans will love this podcast, and you don't have to be an Orioles fan to enjoy it. It was wonderful meeting Adam and Jerry in person at the Baltimore Soundstage, and amazing to be a part of the podcast. Definitely one I will continue to listen to regularly. Thank you, Heather. It sounds like she gets the podcast. Heather, Heather, thank you so much. I mean, that's that's why we you know we tell stories not just about the Orioles or Ravens, Baltimore in general. We go Baltimore and beyond because. You know, with me traveling, you know, you going back and forth to Sarasota, um, you know, there's a lot of different things to talk about in the world, not just Baltimore sports. Um, and there's a lot of cool things, a lot of cool topics. So I appreciate that. And that is true. You don't have to necessarily be an Orioles fan to to like the podcast or to like us because we talk about a wide arrangement of, uh, of things and have wild guests, on too, that aren't just – Oriole based or Baltimore based, they're based all over the world. So really appreciate that because we're trying to broaden our horizons. Absolutely. We're going to talk tennis at some point during this podcast. So be warned because we are going to have Pam Shriver on. All right. One more. A Fantander. That's his handle. A Fantander. I like that. He submitted this podcast review. Adam Jones and Jerry Coleman are a great duo, provide excellent content, and playful banner, great guests, wonderful production overall. Well, I don't know about that. Highly recommend. So we thank him for that, and I guess that was a uh, a compliment for Chip Franklin, who we just don't compliment enough on this podcast, said Chip and no one else. All right, we do want to thank our sponsors, and we ask you to go out and support our dedicated sponsors, including Jimmy's Famous Seafood, where we are today. <laughs> 
The Adam Jones Podcast is brought to you by Jimmy's Famous Seafood, Charm City's favorite crab cake destination. Local sports fan? Experience the ultimate pregame party at the tailgate. Cheer on the Ravens with iconic live performances, an open bar, and mouth-watering eats. Can't make it? No worries. Bring the same food that caught the attention of the Food Network right to your doorstep. Shipping East Coast recipes nationwide. Jimmy's Famous Seafood is the official sponsor of the guests appearing on the Adam Jones Podcast. And by our friends at the Weinman Company. By Hollywood Casino Perryville. For some, it's a game of chance, but for you, it's a game of choice. Hollywood and Barstool are bringing you more ways to bet in Maryland. Catch all the action in person at Hollywood Casino Perryville at the Barstool Sportsbook or bet online with the Barstool Sportsbook app. When you download the Barstool Sportsbook app, register and wager, you can get up to $1,000 bonus cash, plus up to $1,000 when you sign up and wager in person at Hollywood Casino Perryville. Play from anywhere and get up to $2,000. The choice is yours. Must be in the state of Maryland to wager and over 21. Please play responsibly. For help, visit mdgamblinghelp.org or call 1-800-GAMBLER. By Jack Daniels, two legends, one can. Jack and Coke, the number one cocktail in the world, is now available in a can. Yes, that's true. Jack Daniels Tennessee Whiskey, mixed with Coca-Cola or Coca-Cola Zero Sugar, are now both available in a can. Two legends, one can. Jack and Coke, ready to drink? Please drink responsibly. Whiskey specialty, 7% alcohol by volume. Jack Daniels Tennessee Whiskey, Lynchburg, Tennessee. By G-Leaf, medical cannabis only. Visit gleaf.com. Medical cannabis is for qualified Maryland patients only. The Adam Jones Podcast is brought to you by Royal Farms. Download the Royal Farms app from the Apple App Store or Google Play today. New Royal Farms Rewards members will get a free any size cup of Royal Farms award-winning coffee just for signing up. Hey, Justin, keep an eye on the time. It's your night to handle dinner. No worries. Got it covered. It's great getting dinner ready with no worries. That's why I never waste time and go straight to Royal Farms. Their chicken is fresh, never frozen, hand-breaded, and cooked right in the store. Oh, wow, this smells amazing. I'm so impressed. Real fresh, real fast, Royal Farms. And a reminder, if you guys are enjoying this podcast, make sure to check out the Baltimore Banner at thebaltimorebanner.com slash AJ to get started. Again, that's thebaltimorebanner.com slash AJ to get six months of unlimited digital access for only a dollar. Thanks to senior executive producer Chip Franklin for putting this episode together. He delivers like the mailman, whether it be rain, sleet, or snow, or even extreme heat. Go out and subscribe to the Baltimore Banner. Be kind, be real, and be back next week for another episode of the Adam Jones Podcast as Adam leaves the country.